chapter 31, come to a very difficult section of Scripture, difficult section of Scripture to teach, especially when so many would compare chapter 31 with what we see even going on across the world today and would even draw parallels with what we see ISIS doing. But again, who is the one created to say to the one who created us how things should be and how they should go? God has reason and purpose. And as I said at the beginning, none of what we see even anywhere in the Old Testament really makes a whole lot of sense apart from the cross of Christ. And it's the cross of Christ that makes all the sense in the world. And so we have responsibility, just as Israel did as children of God, to rightly represent our Father. I was adamant about that with my children. They didn't always do it, but with my children, when they were going off, that they were representing the family, not so much because their father was a pastor, but just that they were to act as they were raised when they were out of our care. Well, God desires to keep his house clean and in order for the purifying effect that his house is to have upon the world. The children of Israel, the church. We see right at the beginning, there's the church, Ananias and Sapphira, lying to God, and we see the extreme that they went to, or at least God went to, when he struck them dead for lying to the Holy Spirit. And again, the idea there is, is that, well, there's, God is still gracious, God is still merciful. Didn't say he condemned them to hell, it just say we see the anger of the Lord that it acted out against such things, and we need to look at those things for our understanding, for our learning, that we would have a pure heart before the Lord. But then there is the world. There, there, there's the punishing for the purpose of correcting the body of Christ, but then there is the world, the world that rejects the purification offered by the Lord through the church, and they will be judged. Peter pointed this out in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, that we would consider it. For the time has come. Now, when Peter says the time has come, well, it, it, it's still here. For judgment to begin at the house of God. And it begins with us, and if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who, will do, who do not be, <laughs> what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And so the time has come, and now here, that we would first judge ourselves, ourselves collectively. Well, it's got to start individually, that against the word of God, that I would make sure that I'm in a good place with the Lord. Is there any unrepented sin in my life? Anything that would keep me from being in the place that God would bless me. And when I say bless me, I'm not talking about riches, but use me. And then we need to look at ourselves collectively. We as Calvary Chapel, Ontario... Are we in the will of God? Are we moving in the direction that God has set for us? We need to judge. Are you judging me? Yeah. And we should be open to the judgment. Judgment, well, the judgment for the purpose of correction, not desiring and making sure individually that we do not become legalistic or become the Holy Spirit police. But time for judgment or evaluation to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Well, Israel was tempted and they sinned. They joined themselves with the world. We looked at the story a couple of weeks ago in Numbers chapter 25 where they were joined together with the women of the Midianites and of Moab and well, there was sexual immorality that was involved. There was idolatry that was involved in that. But even more than that, Numbers 25, 9, and those who died in the plague, God's judgment was a plague upon his people, the children of Israel. Those who died in the plague were 24,000. Why so strict? Well, again, keep in mind what he's doing. All of these things, everything in the Old Testament, is always leading towards the cross of Christ. Why was the law given? So that we would know that we were sinners, so that when we saw the cross of Christ, that we would humbly come before the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, where's Israel now? They're on the plains of Moab. They're preparing to enter in to the promised land. There's still a lot of lessons of learning to be just that, to be learned. And now 
as they're on the cusp of it, they're going to have to understand and know what is necessary to keep their hearts pure before a holy God. Now here's another lesson in this battle and how these battles are to be fought and the necessity of keeping oneself separated from the world. Well, they didn't do that. Matter of fact, they joined themselves to the world in the most obscene way in the sight of God. And again, a plague entered in. But just as Israel was punished, so will the Midianites for what they did and how they used Balaam, remember that prophet Balaam, to cause Israel to fall. In Numbers chapter 25, verses 16 through 18, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Harass the Midianites and attack them, for they harassed you with their schemes, by which they seduced you in the manner of Peor, and the matter of Cosby, the daughter of the leader of Midian, their sister, who was killed in the day of the plague because of Peor. Peor would be that false prophet, Balaam. And so there was that situation, that situation that was repugnant in the sight of God. And God brought judgment upon his people, but God also said through his people, he's going to bring judgment upon the world, the world that would cause his people to sin. Now, one of the questions that I had, and I'm sure that you had, if you, if you look at this closely, we were so immersed in the Moabites, and now all of a sudden it's all about the Midianites. Now, we know that the Midianites and the Moabites, they were together in what had occurred previously. More than likely, there was the Moabites that overcame the Midianites in some sort of battle somewhere, and they joined forces together. They were consumed in together, but still they were these two separate nations. Well, the judgment here in chapter 31 seems to be directed against the Midianites and not so much inclusive of the Moabites. Now, I'm sure the Moabites, they, they got theirs somewhere along the line, but they are not to be destroyed to the degree that the Midianites are. Why is that? Well, the Moabites are, are, are cousins, if you will, to Israel. If you recall, they came about through Lot's relationship with his daughters, not in a good way, in a very sinful manner, but nonetheless, they did come through that line, and so God's hand of protection for his purposes, of which I don't really know the details of them, but God's got a plan and God's got a purpose. Keep it in mind, everything that you need for holiness is included in the word of God, but the whole history of the world is not included in the word of God. God is doing things in other places and other people's lives that aren't included. Everything that is necessary for our learning that we would know the Lord Jesus Christ is included in here, but not everything that ever happened and ever was said is. So the Bible is very clear for those who cause one of his little ones, his little ones, those who are less mature, to stumble. Now, as most of you know, because I talk about it all the time, I got a new granddaughter. She's a week and a couple of days old, or was it two weeks now? Whatever it is. Two weeks now. What? Okay. I, 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 it's just been a roller coaster. Um, but anyway, she's doing very well. I got to feed her yesterday, and it's just a neat thing to see this little girl. Jamie's with her, and a lot of times you just see the little face peering out, and it's just a really cool thing. Well, looking at this baby, though, the other day, I'm just looking at her. Jamie had sat on the couch next to me, and just looking at her, she is completely helpless. She's completely helpless for everything. She would not be able to survive on her own for very long whatsoever. And we need to see that's how we are in Christ. But more than that, I need to see that's how my neighbor, or maybe I should say it this way, that's how somebody who is less mature than I am in the sight of Christ as well, is just as that little child. Now, never forget, you're like that as well. But I need to see the, I don't want to say the power, but the ability that I have for godliness, but also for evil in the life of somebody that is like that. I, I can take care of this child, and I can raise this child to be a powerful tool in the hands of God, or we've seen what happens when people abuse children as well. Now, Jesus was very poignant about this. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 6 through 7, he says, whoever. So that tells me believer or unbeliever, Whoever is anybody 
whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. So when he's speaking of little ones, he's using less mature who believe in him, speaking of believers, little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offense, for offenses must come, but woe to that man, whoever that man may be, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes, the one who is the instigator here. Well, apparently, well, we know that Balaam was the instigator back there, but apparently used Midian to a greater degree than he used the Moabites to cause Israel to stumble. So what we've seen a lot of lately in the book of Numbers, we, we've seen this, this subject of death both believers and unbelievers, because of man's sinful condition, we see that death will continue to reign. It's why Christ needed to come, so he would take the sting from death. And Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, that would be Adam, thus death spread to all men because all sin. And so we see these people, godly people. We see Miriam. This was Moses' big sister. But... She caused division in the body of Christ. She was a sinner, and, and she died. Aaron. Aaron was the first priest, and we see this man who, who was by, side by side with, with Moses, and well, he was an idolater. At least he caused the people to stumble, and he died. This man, Zimri, you probably heard his name. I don't know if you remember, but back in chapter 25, he was the one who took one of the Midianite women into his tent, and he was run through with a spear. He was a leader in Israel, but he was a fornicator. He died. And then there's Moses. Moses is okay right now, but God has just told him, we saw it a week or two ago, that God's telling him, and we're told again here in verse 1, that he's going to die. And Moses, Moses misrepresented the Lord, and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, in our men's breakfast on Wednesday, men mobilized for Christ, we're going through the book of Ecclesiastes. And I was reminded of a section of Scripture in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, I think it says chapter 1, yeah, it's chapter 2, if it goes up there, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, so I said in my heart, now this is more than likely King Solomon looking at society, again, he uses this term under the sun, when we study this, we look at it apart from God, apart from the knowledge and the realization of God and who God is, and so in verse 15 he said, so I said in my heart, as it happens to the fool, it also happens to me. And why was I then more wise when I said in my heart, this is also vanity, for there is no more remembrance of the wise and of the fool forever, since all that now is will be forgotten to the days to come. And how does the wise man die? As the fool. Therefore I hated life, because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me, for all is vanity and grasping for the wind. And so Solomon, apart from the Lord, realized that there's no meaning to all of this, and there's really no meaning to chapter 31 of the book of Numbers, apart from the cross of Christ. Because it is always God who brings life. Even in the midst of death, it's God who brings life. And as he brings life, he brings it abundantly. More than we can ever ask, more than we can even ever imagine and that we'll not only have eternal life, but we have life in his sight. And so we see all of these things, and this man Moses and his relatives and all of these people, and even the people of the, and all of this that goes on, it all makes sense at the foot of the cross. So concerning Moses and Midian, a command is given in chapter 31, verse 1, verses 1 and 2 actually, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take vengeance on the Midianites for... for for the children of Israel, afterwards you shall be gathered to your people. Gathered to your people means he's going to be, this will be one of the last things he does. Matter of fact, Moses' last act of leadership will be one of vengeance. Now keep in mind, vengeance. The Lord says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I, I, I can't bring vengeance on anybody else, not just vengeance. But know that this vengeance is not revenge. God's vengeance is a holy response when divine authority is challenged by common man. And again, that's what had happened here. This is going to be the millstone effect with the Midianites, if you will, because they cause God's people to stumble. And it's one of those things that I've got to keep in mind when they come up against us, 
when they attack us, when they jail us, as we've seen in this past week, they're not jailing us. They're jailing God, or at least they're attempting to. The attack is always against the Lord. Because why would they care? What difference does it make what we say, what we preach, or what we do? But we see the power of the Word of God and the influence of the Word of God in and through a believer out in society as society is threatened by our mere existence. And again, have you ever just sat and meditated upon how the world is so threatened by the church? And we see everything that is going on as of late seemingly is contrary to the church and contrary to God. And there's this huge attack that is going on. And the reality of, uh, uh, of the matter is they're, they're attacking God. And, and we're going to be looking at not so much that, but in times a little bit this Sunday. We're taking a veer from our verse-by-verse -verse study, and we're going to be looking at, um, through First Timothy, we're going to be looking at uh, the, the Feast of Trumpets this week. We're going to have a Messianic praise team here, and we're going to be looking at the Feast of Trumpets. We're going to see the suddenness of end times, but we're going to see, although it's sudden, we see the signs, because we've been commanded to watch. And we look at the signs of the times even today. And as we see the signs of the times today, and we see the things that are going on across our nation, they're not things we fight against, although we do come up against them through the simple preaching of the Word of God. But what happens as we preach the Word of God? The, the, the attacks even continue to rage even hotter. But God says here, again, that he is to take vengeance, but this is going to be God working vengeance through his people. So Moses mobilizes his men to move out, and what most commentators, I saw this term as I was reading certain commentaries on this section of Scripture, for a holy war. Now, God has definitely commanded this, as this is a command from God, this is definitely holy. It's a war because they're going to fight, so that term fits. But again, where do we see that term used today? You know, using another language, it's a jihad. And, and you see that, and this is not a jihad, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that. But we see how the devil uses that as well. I mean, this is how Islam justifies their atrocities. Well, in the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church tempted to do the same through the Crusades. They organized and authorized the gathering together of an army for what they considered to be a holy purpose. They were trying to go out and to repossess the holy land from Islam that had taken charge of it. They offered certain things to get this army put together. One of them was forgiveness of sins to those who fought in that army as if they had the power to do so, and the release of debt to others. But the result of their holy war wasn't very holy. As they went through the countryside, they pillaged the countries they went through, men looking to enrich themselves. They murdered thousands of Jews, and they suffered the failure of their purpose. So today, should the church be involved in holy wars? Well, John chapter 18, verses 10 through 11. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword in the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Are we to go out there wielding a, and I'm not saying the sword is in the word, but wielding a physical sword? Now, I know there's a time for war and there's a time for peace, and that has its place, no doubt about it. But as far as us and those who come up against God and come up against the church, are we wielding a sword, wielding a sword of, of hate or militism or whatever it might be? Because what did Peter do? Peter lopped off a man's ear. And I'd say to you, what he has done is he's done the worst thing that a born-again believer could possibly do in doing that because now, what happens? This man doesn't have an ear to hear what the Spirit may say to him. And you need to see the rich picture that is there as we do these foolish things, especially as we do them rashly, then there's not the opportunity to share the gospel. The Lord made it right as he glued it back on, if you will, as he healed the man. But, and it's always Jesus who, who covers for our mistakes. But the enemies that the church wars with they're not of flesh and blood, and our weapons, our weapons are spiritual and not carnal. We are to be an army, 
but we are to be an army that marches forth on our knees in a spirit of prayer. We are to be under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, guided by God in that way. And we are to wield, not a sword, but the sword of the Spirit. We are to wield the Word of God. Because it's the Word of God that put me to death, but brought me back to life. It's the Word of God that is going to do the same, that come up against the people of God. We've got to understand that, but more than that, we've got to trust it, that the preaching of the Word of God is enough. It's been said, how do you defend a 300-pound gorilla? Let it out of its cage. How do I defend the gospel? I let it out of its, its cage. Its cage is our heart. and We need to speak it. And as long as we speak it, then it's going to achieve its purposes. And so, the only necessary spilling of blood in the context of the church, it happened some 2,000 years ago on Mount Calvary. So what we're going to be looking at is this battle that is being fought here today. We're going to look at it fairly quickly, but this battle under three headings. The first is going to be the fighting of the battle, verses 2 through 11. Next is going to be the cleansing of the camp, verses 12 through 24. And then the distribution of the spoil, verses 25 through 54. So the first thing we see is the fighting of the battle. I'll read the first six verses and then we'll move on. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take vengeance on the Midianites for the children of Israel. Afterward you shall be gathered to your people. So Moses spoke to the people saying, Arm some of yourselves for war and let them go against the Midianites to take vengeance for the Lord on Midian. A thousand from each tribe of all the tribes of Israel you shall send to war. So there were recruited from the divisions of Israel, 1,000 from each tribe, 12,000 armed for war. Then Moses sent them to the war. 1,000 from each tribe, he sent them to the war with Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, with the holy articles and the signal trumpets in his hand. Holy war is only holy because God commanded it to achieve its purposes. So we see it's God who set the stage here as far as who was going to go, how many people were going to go, and what was going to go before them. And so there was this constant reminder of who it was who was leading the army. I thought it was very interesting that Joshua was not mentioned here. Earlier there was a battle and General Joshua was at the forefront leading the fight. And I don't know if he was involved in this or not. It's not spoken of here, but there's Eleazar. So a couple things you need to see and need to see and draw parallels with the battle that we fought. First, all the tribes of Israel were to be represented in an equal amount. We all fight together. We're all part of the army. Matter of fact, those thousands were not only the ones to go into battle, but they were representing their tribe. There was the support of them as well with the tribe. And we'll see that that tribe was due some of the spoil as well. And so we are to be together. We all fight for the same God, according to the same calling, for the same reason, and work together for the same victory. There's some people to be out in the forefront, some people are to be support in the back, but the fact of the matter is all are going to be, or all are, equal in this work, this battle that is to be fought. We need to remember that not one of us has been called to fight alone. And also that support and reinforcements are only a call away. Alone, we will be defeated. United, we will prevail. Also, we see instead again of General Joshua, the leader of the Lord's army, is the priest Phineas. Phineas, why? I think for two reasons. First, this is a battle that the Lord has called, and so he put one of his priests in the forefront. Now, the other battles, the ones that Joshua was going to lead, yeah, they were by the Lord, but this is setting the standard. You fight a holy battle. So not only this battle, but the other battles, this is of God. And we've got the man who's representing the people to God and God to the people at the forefront, so they should have the confidence that God is in it. But not only because of that, also that they are to have the passion of that particular priest. 
because we've read about him before. Again, in Numbers chapter 25, verse 11, it says, And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, was, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel, because he was zealous with my zeal among them, so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. He was the one who stepped up and did what was necessary to see that fornication stop, to see the idolatry come to a, a, an end. He was standing in the gap. He was making a wall, How, whatever terminology you want to use, but he was the one who knew what the right thing was to do and did the right thing. And because he did the right thing, people are alive that day. People are alive. Thank God for that man, that man who was willing to stand up when everybody else was going in a different direction and do the good and the godly thing. Also, there were the articles and the trumpets. The trumpets were the silver trumpets, I think. Yeah, they're in chapter 10, the two silver trumpets. Also, the rest of the articles, I don't know what they were. It doesn't say. Was the ark one of the articles? You would think it would say ark if the ark was there, but I don't know. But the idea here is, is just the remembrance that God is going before us. Why? Because this is a battle that God has called us to fight. Reminder of the existence of God, but also the obedience to God. In Numbers chapter 10, verses 8 through 9, it says, The sons of Aaron the priest shall blow the trumpets, and these shall be to you as an ordinance forever throughout your generations. When you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, and you will be remembered before the Lord your God, and you will be saved from your enemies. So when you go to battle, he's saying, Take these silver trumpets and, and blow them. And so, through an act of obedience, that's exactly what they're doing. When God says to do something, you just do it. Verse 7, And they warred against the Midianites, just as the Lord commanded Moses, and they killed all the males. When God calls you to the battle, you will overcome, and the victory will be thorough. He killed, they killed all of the males. Why? Because God desired for them to kill all all the males. Is this a right thing? Is this a good thing? This is God's thing. They are his. He is the creator of all. He has commanded this to happen. If they didn't do that, it would have came back upon them. We've already studied Deuter well, we've already studied Joshua, and they didn't kill all that they were supposed to kill, and what did it do? It came back to harass and to haunt Israel. Saul was commanded to kill all the Amalekites, and what happened at the end of his life? Well, at the end of his life, he committed suicide, but there was an Amalekite that came to David, and he boasted. He boasted that he killed Saul. And so the enemy that you leave in your life, it will boast against you. And so remember, though, the position from which we war, Romans chapter 8, verse 31, what shall we say to these things? What are the things? All things working together for the good. Speaking of predestination that God spoke about before, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? If God is for us and God is for you, he died upon the cross so that you would know that, who can be against you? And really, the real question at that point is, isn't so much about God being for me, because that's a given he is, but what I need to consider, am I for God? Am I for God? See, if Israel's for God, then they do what God had called and commanded them to do. And so, if I'm for God and He for me, then who can stand against us? The world can't, because Jesus said, I've overcome the world. Can Satan? Well, Satan was defeated at the cross. And really, the biggest thing that I war against today, that I really need to kill off today, is my flesh. Is the flesh that so easily ensnares me is the flesh that sets me outside of the place that God will bless. But the thing that I need to know in that battle, even against the flesh, Romans 8.37, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Somebody who is more than a conqueror is somebody who fights from the standpoint of victory. Israel, if you do all that God says, you go off into that battle and you fight from the standpoint of victory. We'll see as we close this out, which is going to happen in about five minutes, um, not one Israelite was killed in this battle. 8 and 11. They killed the kings of Midian with the rest of those who were killed. So it speaks of how thorough this was. Evi, Rechim, 
Zur, Hur, Reba, the five kings of Midian. Now look where Balaam. We saw Balaam with a few chapters was spoken of him, and now he gets the last part of one verse. And Balaam, the son of Beor, they also killed with the sword. Why? Because this man is nothing in the sight of God. This would be Balaam receiving his millstone and thrown into the deepest part of the ocean, if you will. Verse 9, And the children of Israel took the women of the Midianite captive, of the uh, women of Midian captive with their little ones and took as spoil all their cattle, all their flocks, and all their goods. And they also burned with fire all the cities where they dwelt and all their forts. Now this bears to be spoken of at this point because we see what ISIS is doing and what they're doing to these young women that they're taking captive and all. Israel, they took these women captive, but they were to conduct themselves in all purity. We already saw what would happen if they fornicated. 20,000 graves were in the wilderness, and that's a picture of what happens if you touch, really, any woman in, in, in fornication. It, it'll bring death to the people. And so this wasn't about that, and so you, you can't even go there with that. These women were to be used as servants. Matter of fact, in the law of God, it says, if you have captured this woman and she pleases you, there was even an, a, an opportunity to marry them and fold them into the body of Christ. We see in the genealogy of Christ, there are women who were foreigners who were brought into the body of Christ. Ruth was, and, and, and so I've got to understand that this is God's plan to fold them into the body. And so the things that we see going on in, around the world with those who are not of God cannot be compared to the Lord and the things of the Lord. Next, we see the cleansing of the camp. Then they brought to the captives the booty and the spoil of Moses to Eleazar the priest and to the congregation of the children of Israel to the camp in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho. So this is, again, right on the cusp of entering into the promised land. And Moses, Eleazar the priest, and all the leaders of the congregation went to meet them outside the camp. But Moses was angry with the officers of the army, with the captains over thousands and the captains over hundreds who had come from the battle. And Moses said to them, Have you kept all the women alive? Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor, and there was a plague amongst the congregation of the Lord. Now therefore, kill every male amongst the little ones and every woman who has known a man intimately, but keep alive for yourselves all the young girls who have not known a man intimately. So, cleansing of camp, and the first area of cleansing is that which caused them to stumble in the first place. These women have already been used by the enemy of God to destroy, at least an attempt to destroy the people of God. And the idea is that they would continue to do it. And so I've got to look at myself, the things in my life, especially the things that I have struggled with in the past, are you killing them off? Or are you allowing them to live in the camp? Because if you allow them to live in the camp, sooner or later they're going to rear their ugly head once again. There was on the news a pastor, a pastor who allowed a woman of Midian, if you will, to live in his camp. And he was one of the people that signed on to that internet site. It's a site that existed for the purpose of adultery, of, of, of putting together men and women who were married to, you know, were married, putting them together with people that they were not married to. And there was a pastor who came up on that list of Ashley Madison. And it came so much, it overwhelmed him to such a degree, unfortunately, he committed suicide. I need to see, if I'm allowing these things to live in the camp, sooner or later they're going to rear their ugly head and they're going to take it down. And so this was a hard thing. I mean, it is a hard thing. Keep in mind, they had to go out and, and kill these women and, and even these young boys and just think of how difficult that might be. And you can offer God every excuse why we ought not to do that, but should the thing created speak to the Creator, what should happen, what should come to pass? It was a command of God. Galatians 5.24, And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The second area of cleansing is the soldiers. Verse 19, as for you, remain outside the camp seven days. Whoever has killed any person and who has ever touched, uh, who has touched any slain, purify yourselves and your captives on the third day and, the and on the seventh day. 
Purify every garment, everything made of leather, everything woven of goat's hair, and everything made of wood. The idea here is, is that they would not be defiled by the touching of the dead or the blood. Remember the blood? The blood is always to be kept pure. It's only God that is able to handle the blood, and it's only his blood that was going to be able to be spilled for the sins of man. And part of what's involved here is, since these soldiers went out and killed, they ought not to enjoy it. They're going to be, there's going to be a lot more killing to be done as they enter into the promised land. But as God has a respect for the sanctity of life, man is to have a respect for the sanctity of life as well. Again, Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and you may have it more abundantly. And so, so that man would not enjoy this. First of all, we saw back when we studied Exodus, there was a ransom to be paid, but also there's a cleansing to be done. And the next area of cleansing, the next area of cleansing is to be the spoil here. Verses 21 through 24, Then Eleazar the priest said to the men of war who had gone to battle, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord commanded Moses. Only the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, the tin, and the lead, everything that can endure fire, you shall put through the fire and shall be clean, and it shall be purified with the water of purification. But all that cannot endure fire you shall put through water, and you shall wash your clothes on the seventh day and be clean, and afterwards you may come into the camp. And so all of this stuff, the idea is, is to recognize that this is given to us by God. This great victory was by God, and it is to be used to the glory of God. And so you must consider how you perceive all that the Lord has given to you. Have you purified it? Have you dedicated it to his will? Have you cleansed your paycheck? Have you cleansed your possessions? Have you cleansed your children, your spouses, whatever? And what I mean by that is, is understanding that it has come from the hand of God and it is to be used for the glory of God. So I must consider the things I buy. and the thing, I'm not saying take your paycheck and give it to the church. I'm just saying tithe, honor God in your tithes and offerings, in your house payment, in your dealings, and all of these things, and understand that this has come about through God, and it is to be pure in the sight of God. Lord, may I not use these things that you have blessed me with and given to me as a steward for anything that would be contrary to you. First Chronicles 29.3, King David said, Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have preferred all that I have prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure of gold and silver. He's honoring God with all that he has. And then thirdly, verses 25 through 54, I won't, go, I won't read through all of that, but you have the distribution of the spoil. The spoil of war was to be divided 50-50 between those who fought and those who stayed behind. Now, of those who fought, they would give of a ratio of 1 to 500. So every 500 slaves would be given to the priest for the purpose of temple uh, uh, worship, uh, service. Uh, the gold that they got, one of it, one, the ratio was 1 to 500. For those who stayed behind, they would be, need to give more, 1 to 50, because obviously the ones who fought put more out on the line than the other ones. But the bottom line is all that was to be given was to be given for the work of ministry. Recognition that we're God's people and a recognition of that which is dear to me and your paycheck should be dear to you. Your tithe should be dear to you. Again, as I've said before, what does your paycheck represent? It represents God's provision to you and your family. It represents time spent away from your family and things that you enjoy to do. Spend minimum, most of us, 40 hours at work. And so it represents the toil and it represents sweat and effort and all of these things. But also I got to represent before God that it's come before him. And as all things come from God, I honor God with all that he's given me. Verse 48, then the officers who were over thousands of the army, the captains of thousands and captains of hundreds, came near to Moses and they said to Moses, your servants have taken account of the men of war who are under our command and not a man of us is missing. Nobody was killed in the battle. Therefore, we have brought an offering. Now, this is just a free will offering just to worship God and give God the glory. Therefore, we have brought an offering for the Lord 
what every man found of ornaments of gold, armlets, bracelets, and signet rings, and earrings, and necklaces to make atonement for ourselves before the Lord. So he must understand that, all, and you've got a picture of the grace of God here, that we want to offer this offering because although we were deserving of death as well, God kept us. Verse 51, So Moses and Eliezer the priests received the gold from them and all the fashioned ornaments and all the gold of the offering that they offered to the Lord from the captains of thousands, captains of hundreds, was 16,715 shekels. The men of war had taken spoil, every man for himself. And Moses and Eleazar the priest received the gold from the captains of thousands and of hundreds and brought it into the tabernacle of meeting as a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord, as a memorial for all that God has done. Later on, Joshua will not only recognize what happened here, but throughout the battles that were fought in the promised land when he said, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised you just as he had fought for Israel back then, the promises to you today that God will fight for you. What is it that you are battling against today? Bring God into the battle. Understand that he goes before you. Know that you are more than a conqueror. Understand that if God is for you, then nobody can be against you, and I guarantee you, you will see victory in your Christian life. Father, once again, we just thank you for your word, your word, Lord, that even in these difficult chapters of your, of your Bible, that, Father, they just ring forth of who you are, and, Lord, just the things that you have done, that you want to do for your people and through your people. And I just pray, Father, that we would see these concepts in the battles that we fight. Now, Lord, sometimes the battle's going to rage, and the battle's going to rage for a while. Help us to endure to the end. Sometimes victory is going to come quickly and the battle is going to be short. Father, I pray that we would be humble and that we would understand that victory does come from your hand. But either way, Father, I pray that we would be a people who do not, oh Lord, in the Christian life, there's no retreat and there's no surrender. May we be pushing forward, Lord, constantly and, and, and Lord, forcefully, but most of all, that in you, that we would see the victories that you would bring in and through our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We all stand, please. As I said earlier, that we are going to have a little topical twist in our Bible study this Sunday. We're going to be looking, well, this Sunday is actually the day of the Feast of Trumpets, and so we are going to be having that special day and looking at the Feast of Trumpets and the significance in our Christian lives today and what the Lord was always pointing towards and even what he's pointing towards today. We're going to have special guests for worship, and I just pray it's just going to be a, a neat, neat time to be a Calvary Chapel, Ontario in. God bless you guys. <laughs>